And this thing that uh, you probably are aware, the post-injection sedation syndrome. Post-injection sedation syndrome. So we must keep the patient for two, three hours after the injection in the outpatient unit. This is not very comfortable, honestly, but we have to do it. So olanzapine, as you know, is a peculiar compared to the other uh, antipsychotics. High metabolic, high weight gain, sedation. Not much, not much uh, uh, neurological side effects. Some anticholinergic. So if you want a sedative, long acting, olanzapine is an option but it is said it could be good for some patients, but we must consider this. Not as sedative as propenantine, and with much better tolerated than propenantine. So if you think to use propenantine or, uh, or olanzapine, olanzapine is better. Be careful of the post-injection syndrome. Some cases leading to coma have been reported. And so patients should be uh, kept uh, in observation for at least two or three hours uh, in order to avoid uh, the appearance of the syndrome when they are at home. So these are the limitations of uh, online that we already discussed. Now, another drug that I think is interesting. Aripiprazole. Very recently approved for prescription. Long-acting intramuscular for aripiprazole. Indicated for the treatment of schizophrenia. And the results are very interesting because if we consider uh, this is a very recent paper of uh, few months ago. Higher dose is probably a little bit more effective compared to the lower dose, not much, honestly. But very clearly better than placebo. So, which is my opinion on Aripiprazole long acting? I think it's very interesting and very useful for specific patients. Because you know, Aripiprazole is a partial agonist of dopamine D2. So it's not much antipsychotic, not much effective when you have very strong positive symptoms or very strong delusion or hallucinations. But it's very good for the mild cases where you have, um, for example, predominant negative symptomatology or you have schizoaffective issues. For those patients so that are very sensitive to neurological side effects, for those patients, aripiprazole long-acting is a very good option. So if I have a very severe schizophrenia, I will not use aripiprazole. Also, we did a paper that you will see later in the next presentation that for severe schizophrenia, Aripiprazole, <laughs> in my opinion, is not probably the best option. But for a, a, a large part of patients, Aripiprazole is very good. And to have it uh, for a long acting is a good option. Usually we start with 400. Uh, 400 is also usually the most common uh, uh, dose. The patients that we treat usually stay at 400. That is probably the most, the better dose. Also because um, 800 uh, is not much more effective. The tolerability that is the same of our different or of course, no much metabolic changes. Some appears, but not many. Some patients may have activation. And so in the, our big table, aripiprazole has a particular side effect profile. 
no metabolic profile, not much QTC effect, not much sedation, not at all anticholinergic, some neurological side effect, but not many. So, a drug that is well tolerated, very well tolerated. Good activating for the partial efficacy on D2, but some cautious uh, warning with very severe patients. But repeat, this is my opinion. So if I have a very, very severe patient, extremely severe patient, of course I have to use aloperidol, even if it's full of side effects. If I have a severe patient, I will work on uh, Paliperidone for sure. If I have a less severe patient with a lot of anxiety and uh, uh, sleeping problem, olanzapine is an option. If I have a patient with not so uh, positive symptoms but uh, with negative symptoms and very sensitive to side effects, I will work on long acting uh, aliphine. So you see, every drug has a specificity. There is no good drug or bad drug, it depends on the patient. Okay, few slides on what is coming next. These are the drugs that you will have in the next two, three years. What will come out in the next five to ten years? There are many, many drugs in development. If we consider schizophrenia, phase one, phase two, uh, phase three, and submitted, we have many drugs. So, in the future, we are confident that we will have other options that will help us to treat the patient in the proper way. Here is a long list, but don't worry, I will focus on some aspects. Uh, Brexpibrazone is another uh, um, drug close to aripiprazol with some possible advantages, effective in a range of conditions. Uh, it is uh, not available yet in Italy and in Russia, probably it will be available soon. We can discuss it probably in the next meeting. Bitopertin was a glycine inhibitor, so Glycine is working in the glycine, yes, glycine. That uh, it could be very useful in terms of uh, uh, mm, combination treatment in schizophrenia. But the problem is that it has been discontinued because uh, uh, the company Roche saw that it was not as effective as they thought. I want you to focus on this, that is cariprazine. Cariprazine is an extremely interesting drug. You probably will, uh, will see the market, uh, I think, not sooner than five years from now. But from what I know, cariprazine is very interesting. It's the only drug that has an effect that is higher in D3 than in D2, and is a partial agonist. So it's not similar to any drug that we have now. It's a combination of uh, Aripiprazol and uh, Florzapine depends what you consider. In any case, in the phase two or three studies, it uh, was very interesting because it was effective in schizophrenia, in bipolar, and in depression. So it seems that this is another drug, like in ketiapine, that has a multi, multi-diagnosis effect. So, I, I, I believe a lot that this drug will be very interesting for the next year. Then we have a number of alpha-7 agonists. This is one, but you will see other also. That is used in the cognitive impair, in cognitive impairment associated with schizophrenia. So a cognitive enhancer. You've seen the effect of paliperidone that was interesting. <coughs> Cognitive enhancement, we need to improve the cognition of schizophrenic patients. Alpha 7 agonist is what, what they can do. Phase 2, so even farther in the future. 
other alpha 7 agonism, glutamatergic modulators that would be very interesting for schizophrenia, but we are still uh, far from any result. One uh, serotonin 2A receptor agonist, wow. I am not very convinced that this would be a good option. Then we have a number of phosphodiesterase inhibitors that, according to some people, they could improve <coughs> positive and negative symptomatology of schizophrenia. They are still in phase two, so it's very early to see them. And finally, we have the phase one, the very, very starting, very new drugs, of which uh, we have another phosphodiesterase 10 and one phosphodiesterase 1 drug. And uh, we have uh, this one for cognitive impairment in uh, schizophrenia. This is uh, an histaminergic modulator. This is an interesting idea, but we have to test it. So, you have seen until now the new drugs that you have, the new drugs that you will have soon, and the new drugs that you will have a little bit later. All of them have some interesting positive profiles or negative aspects, depending on the drug. The last few minutes, I want to talk to you about something that we don't consider usually, nutri We don't need only to use drugs. We can use also different strategies. Audio is there? Okay. We don't use maltis, but we should use them more. Nutriceptical. We have easy tools that are without side effects that we should use more with just a small list. You can see some reviews, nutritional intervention on treatment of schizophrenia. One that is, in terms of efficacy, I put first, is NAC, N-acetylcysteine. Two, two randomized clinical trials confirm the positive effects on negative and general symptoms that are the most difficult to treat. This is why we started to use NAC in schizophrenic patients. This is it's nothing, it's what we used for, uh, for the lung uh, problems. It, it's, it's a very simple drug. Uh, you can buy in many countries without prescription. It's, it's an over-the-counter drug, so it's very easy to find. So consider the possibility to give to your patients, try to sum to your patients. NAC, you can find easily. It is not expensive. <coughs> 600 milligrams once a day or uh, 300 twice a day. You can see how it works. Another interesting possibility is this one, alpha lipoic acid, that it can influence the weight gain. You will see this in the next presentation. <coughs> Melatonin could be useful for sleep. And also vitamin C, some people suggest it could be useful for symptomatology. Vitamin E could be useful for tardive dyskinesia. Omega-3, the fish. In Russia you have a lot of fish, so patients are very eating omega-3, I think, every day. But Omega-3, one gram, two grams, would be a good option also. And other with vitamins that you will see, but uh, I want to focus on this last point. Microbiome. This is something that is uh, starting to appear now in the literature. That is the bacteria that we have in our gut. It seems that the bacteria that we have is very connected uh, to the behavior of the, uh, of the patients. And this is something that started uh, to increase very recently, in the last years. 
The idea is that if we have an unbalanced bacteria population, they influence the production of neurotransmitters and the absorption. So we have a, a behavioral and psychic effect of the bacteria that we have. <coughs> this is why it is important uh, to focus on this. I will not give you specific indication because the field is still under investigation, but keep your eyes open on this because it can be used. For example, eating uh, the probiotic uh, bacteria, this kind of things. So what will happen in the next few years? Usually a lot of drugs don't survive the market. And this is the reason why a lot of pessimism uh, was uh, in the drugs uh, vanishing the clinical psychopharmacology, psychopharmacology crisis, a lot of companies disappearing. But I think that things are going to change now because recently a lot of drugs, as you have seen, are starting to come out. So I think psychiatry, we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. New drugs are coming out, new compounds, new research, so I think that in the next year, as I showed you, we will have a lot of possibilities. The last slide, remember from this presentation that a number of new antipsychotics are available. In the future, we will have further ones. What is very important is a careful choice. Every drug has positive and negative aspects. If we know all of them, we can treat them the patients in a, in a much better way. Okay, thank you for your attention, and I will ask you to write down your questions, so we will discuss all of them together after the next presentation, because they are closely linked.